The date is September 15th, 2018, and something just happened that would change the Destiny community forever. Oh, let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Oh, you guys voices? The new raid, Last Wish, had just been beaten for the first time, and it had taken the victors an astounding 18 hours and 49 minutes of dedication, teamwork, and skill to complete. To put it into perspective, most other world's first clears were around 4-6 to six hours. Just 5 years later, this behemoth of a raid was cleared in just under 13 minutes. Raids are some of the most lengthy and challenging activities that the Destiny franchise has to offer, requiring a team of six players to work together to solve puzzles, clear hordes of enemies, and defeat bosses. Among the numerous raids in Destiny history, Last Wish has developed a reputation as one of the most challenging raids in Destiny, containing more encounters and covering more ground than every other raid. Last Wish released in September 2018 alongside what many players now cherish as Destiny 2's greatest expansion of all time, Forsaken. This is the story of how a community of skilled players pushed the limits of what was possible through years of optimization, discovering new glitches and strategies, and adopting the constant evolution of the game's live service sandbox. These players have mastered Destiny's unique six-player cooperative speedruns. But the story of Last Wish is not just one of hardship and triumph. It's a story of highs and lows, genius innovations, and the quest for the world's fastest clear. With such a large amount of space in the raid to devise on new strategies, Last Wish speedruns would evolve over the next five years into some of the most interesting and creative speedruns that Destiny has to offer. This is the history of Last Wish world record speedruns. Shit, boys. We fing did it! We fing did it! Holy shit! Holy shit! Just a few weeks after the raid was released, the same team that completed the world's first clear submitted the first run on speedrun.com. And just two weeks later, the first record was broken by Slayer Ridge's team with a 23 minute and 41 second run to begin the quest for the fastest clear. Welcome to the early days of Last Wish speedrunning. For the most part, Last Wish is a raid that's not time gated, meaning most of the speed of your run is dependent on your team's efficiency, rather than waiting for the game to finish an internal timer. During the first encounter, the speed that you went was entirely dependent on how fast your team could burn the boss's health bar. If you could melt the boss fast enough, you could ignore the majority of the mechanics of the encounter. The boss teleports between capture plates during this encounter, and teams were able to kill the boss in two plates with optimal damage strategies using the Aikello Shotgun, Whisper the Worm, and Celestial Nighthawk Golden Gun to take advantage of this boss's higher headshot multiplier, allowing the boss only to teleport once. Doing this would shave minutes off of runs. The second new strategy that was developed early on in Last Wish Speeds was a particularly creative one developed for the Vault Encounter. The Vault Encounter's mechanics are needlessly complicated, so I'll spare you the details, but what matters is that the routing of the encounter was intended to be ran like this. Killing a captain here, grabbing the orbit drops, and running around the side. But players found a way to skip running around the sides of the arena by using a tractor cannon to boot the captain towards the middle of the arena to kill it and pick up the buff near the location of the deposit, 
effectively skipping the entire hike around the arena and negating the time loss that the chamber ceiling caused. This strategy was dubbed the boop and would continue to be used across all future runs. And of course, everyone who's done a last wish knows about the ribbon cheese. Five players can head to the side of the arena that the boss is going to be damaged on based on either sound keys or adjoining ally zone in a wall, while another player goes to the other side of the arena to send the boss over to their teammates to speed up the encounter. From there, it's all down to how fast a team can nuke the boss. In Destiny, the tools for speedrunning are different than most games. The game's constant lives in one giant ever-evolving sandbox where new gear and abilities are frequently being introduced into the game along with constant balance changes and patches for glitches and bugs. This makes speedrunning in Destiny an unpredictable and ever-changing experience. And as the game evolves and players improve, the runs get faster and faster. The most popular weapons at the time were the Whisper of the Worm Sniper for long range and the Aikilo Shotgun with Trench Barrel for short range. At the time, Trench Barrel gave you a damage boost for a short time with no shot limit after meleeing. Now, it only gives you three shots worth of the damage bonus. With pre-nerf Luna Faction boots, which used to auto-load your weapons completely while you stood in the rift, you could dump an entire reserve of a shotgun with Trench Barrel's damage boost active on anything you could get close to, which is basically every boss in the raid. For the final boss, Riven, a unique damage strategy emerged. Due to the hitbox of the inside of her mouth, you could shoot cluster bomb rockets in there and all of the cluster bombs would get stuck inside of the boss's hitbox. These rockets, combined with the old auto-loading Luna Faction boots, allowed teams to dump full rocket mags into the boss and melt the boss in seconds. Only two days after the first world record was broken, Clan Redeem, who had the previous record, came back to reclaim the record with a 1 minute and 17 second improvement, resulting in a 22-24 run. The run included some new movement tech which was using the Worldline Zero Exotic Swords teleport attack to launch a teammate forward that was holding the heart during Queen's Walk. Other than that, the run was executed more cleanly overall, and featured Worldline skating during the transitions for faster movement. The record would prove to be more difficult to beat until new strategies were discovered. The next big break came a month and a half later, with another big jump, with a 20 minute and 58 second run by Wrath. At this point in Destiny 2, people were starting to take rating more seriously and player skills were rapidly increasing. This team had cleaner play and far superior movement tech, and with much more world line skating, as well as sword skating in between. One new strategy implemented was in the last encounter, Queen's Walk. In the vault, someone would go forward with a fast super, like a Nova Warp, to grab the heart through the wall where the other person would drop it. This skip saved quite a bit of time that would normally be spent going through corridors. This was low risk as it only costed two people and had some lenience as the heart would roll down the stairs into a wall if it wasn't dropped exactly in the right spot. At the time, this run felt so unbeatable that people stopped doing runs for a while, and it would be another five months until the record was beaten again. The next big break was in May of 2019. Team Luminous shattered the old record by a clean 30 seconds. Throughout the raid, they stayed almost exactly on pace with the previous record holders, gaining a bit of time on Surochi with more efficient DPS, but losing a bit of time during a transition to the next encounter, Morgeth. The two teams were neck and neck through Volt, executing the boops perfectly, unlocking the Volt, and arriving at the Riven boss fight with less than 5 seconds apart from each other. But at the jumping puzzle during the final stand of Riven, Luminous did something unexpected, something that had never been executed in a run before. In the jumping puzzle during Riven's final stand, there are taken phalanx enemies scattered around, enemies with shields that exist solely to blast you off the map. Luminous discovered a way to use the phalanx's attacks in their favor and have one of them boop a player straight up towards the exit. They combined this tech with another relatively new discovery, holding a charged healing grenade in your hand with the new Middle Tree Solar Warlock class would allow you to keep directional momentum for longer. This resulted in a complete skip of the jumping puzzle, using the Phalanx's boop to send a player flying straight toward the exit. This strategy alone would shave almost 30 seconds off of the run and shatter the old world record. Shortly after this, Luminous doubled down and optimized their run with the new strategy, cleaning up their slip-ups in Suro to Morgoth transition and saving a bit of time here and there across the run. They solidified a 20.09 run, 19 seconds faster than their previous run. Four months later, 
A new team named Fast was built from two previous record holders from other teams, as well as some up-and-coming runners. This team boasted an insane amount of individual talent, as well as better team synergy than ever seen before, and they were about to dominate the Wish speedrunning scene. In many encounters, objective progressions are triggered by defeating certain enemies. In Surochi, killing knights and as as fast as possible is the key to staying on pace. In Morgoth, defeating captains and other as quickly can speed up the progression as well. This new team was crushing these mechanics, making sure that every spawn was well prepared for and no enemies were unaccounted for. Without using any new strats, they were able to beat the previous record by almost a minute saving 20 seconds on Sorochi, 10 seconds on Morgoth, and 10 more seconds on Volt, purely due to their efficiency and superior movement, resulting in an insanely clean 19 minute and 15 second run. A few months later, the Joker's Wild update came out, and two new tools were introduced to the game that speedrunners could take advantage of. Top Tree Solar Warlock gained Icarus Dash, a new movement ability. On release, you could use these air dodges along with jumps and glides to rapidly accelerate your movement, and it had an insane uptime of 2 charges every 5 seconds. This new ability alone further solidified Warlocks as the best speedrunning class over Hunters and Titans, and at this point, most teams had all 6 players playing Warlock. The second thing that was added to the game was Astro Cyverse an exotic helmet for warlocks that increased blink distance, causing the blink strats that were used during the Volt encounter to become faster and easier to execute. After the Joker's Wild update released, speedrunners went back to beat the old record with their newfound tools. After all, they had a huge advantage over the old run now. But once again, Fast obliterated the record with a clean 1852 run utilizing the new tools and a new small time save. During the ending of the Volt encounter, one player could jump up and squeeze through a hole in an intangible wall, getting ahead of the doorway that players normally would have to wait to open. As soon as the encounter ends, this out of bounds player could race ahead to the Riven boss room and trigger the doors to open. Although the out of bounds player couldn't go any further while the encounter was still happening due to the turn back zone, this little glitch saves a good 5 seconds of the run that players would otherwise have to spend waiting for the door to open. A few months later, Fast put up yet again another completely dominant speedrun for a back-to-back, -back, two-back world record. Using no new strategies whatsoever, they were able to improve their last record and blow it out of the water using raw skill and efficiency, optimizing any mistake that they had made in their last run. They managed to save 10 seconds on Sorochi, 10 seconds on the transition to Morgoth, 10 seconds on Morgoth, 15 seconds on Volt, and 15 seconds on the Phalanx skip. In total, shaving off an entire minute off of their previous world record with a 1751 run. This team was in a league above the rest, completely dominating the Wish speedrunning scene. Runners were beginning to get discouraged, and no one was making any new breakthroughs. Throughout the rest of 2019 and 2020, teams were still doing runs, but no one was getting comparable times. Members of the community started to feel discouraged, and attempts slowly stopped trickling in. Other than one run from Silomar that would improve the record by only one second in late 2020, Fast would dominate the last Wish World Records for almost two years. As for Silomar, you'll hear more about them later. Begin 2021. Near the beginning of the year, the annual DLC Beyond Light released, and with it came a newfound inspiration for teams to start running Wish again. This update marked the beginning of a massive spur of innovation and modern strategy development. And boy did these get crazy. Welcome to the modern era of Wish speedrunning.
To get a better understanding of the dynamic of modern wish speedrunning, I've brought in Aegis, the current last wish record holder and fellow content creator. Make sure to check out his videos if you're interested in any endgame PvE activities or speedrunning. Links in the description. Hi, my name is Aegis. I'm a Destiny 2 speedrunner. Uh, I've been speedrunning raids for about one and a half years now, and I have about half the raid records in the game. So I have Vog, Vow, King's Fall, Last Wish, and uh, Any Percent Wish, which I, I guess apparently counts as its own category. Out of all these runs you do, what makes Wish speedrunning special to you? Wish is the last, uh, kind of like the oldest raid in Destiny 2 that has not been sunset. And as a result, it's um, kind of kept a lot of tradition uh, alive that isn't really there in um, new speedruns. I mean, it's kind of moved away from that in the recent past, but Wish was kind of viewed as a very movement intensive raid. Uh, up until around, I would say like a year ago, uh, Wish was run with six Warlocks or five Warlocks and like one Titan. So it was very, very movement focused. A lot of the transitions were done as a team um, or they were done, you know, with a couple people, but they were very, very like movement oriented. And it was something that people really enjoyed about the raid. Um, me personally, um, Wish is a pretty good speedrunning raid because a lot of the raid uh, isn't really time gated and a lot of the team is involved in a lot of the encounters. So I would say I would say most people, most speedrunners agree that Wish is has a, a very well understood speedrunning legacy, and it's definitely one of the most enjoyable raids to run right now. A few months after Beyond Light was released and new strategies were beginning to simmer, a team made up of players scattered across previous teams seized the record with an unheard of time save, with an entire minute and a half over the previous record, clocking in at 1618. The newest run would employ six new strategies, which when combined together could save an immense amount of time. In the entrance to the raid, players would have to sit there and wait for what seemed like forever to listen to some dialogue before the wall would open and let them continue. During modern strategy development, someone discovered an intangible wall that you could simply jump through to get out of bounds while waiting for the entrance dialogue. This out of bounds area is insanely tough to navigate with many places that could get you permanently wedged along with a ton of invisible walls and kill barriers. But if there's a will, there's a way. Eventually, a route was found that allowed runners to navigate through the out of bounds area to the load zones for the first encounter at a pace that was faster than doing it normally. This route was tough, requiring players to use abilities to scale walls and squeeze through tight spaces, a nightmare for six people all bumping into each other trying to get to the same place. The next thing that was developed was something less raid specific and more general to the mechanics of the game. If you've played Destiny during this time, you've probably heard of hot swapping. Hot swapping takes advantage of a mechanic that was built into the game where sprinting would automatically steal your weapon and exiting the sprint would automatically ready your weapon. If you got the timing down, you could tap sprint while swapping between weapons, almost instantly switching to the next weapon. Hot swapping was known about before this point, but wasn't popularized in PvE at the time due to Luna Faction Boots auto reloading everything. However, Luna Faction Boots caught a nerf sometime before this, and more powerful loadouts were needed to optimize damage. This was the beginning of the age of double specials. Rather than using a primary weapon for killing small things and a special weapon for healthier targets, speedrunners quickly realized that they could just run two special weapons to optimize add clear and output more damage. As long as they were efficient enough with their ammo, they wouldn't run out. Double specials would become standard for every runner from this point on. The next new strategy that was developed was for Suroshi's puzzle section, and it would save a substantial amount of time, but proved to be inconsistent, adding a layer of RNG that could end runs. During the Shirochi puzzle, players would have to stand on specific plates in a 3x3 grid to solve a few simple fill-in-the-blank puzzles, but the plates would constantly damage players standing on them, and once you got off of a plate, you weren't able to use it again. The strategy that was developed had one player stand on the middle plate while four more players stood around them and slid from plate to plate, effectively registering nine plates at the same time and completing all three puzzles. This strategy was dubbed the washing machine for its motion and would prove to be a massive pain for runners due to slides not registering multiple plates due to Bungie's peer-to-peer -peer connection. The nature of these servers made the washing machine painfully inconsistent and would commonly result in runs being reset during this encounter. 
Washing is the reason why he probably called it inconsistent is because it kind of depends on the connection of your teammates. So the way washing right. works is that in Shiro, when you um, move from one plate to another, there's a brief period of time where the game thinks you're still on one plate before you move on to the next one. And the plate will stay up while it still thinks you're there. And then it will sink down when it thinks you're not there anymore. And unfortunately, uh, depending on the connection that you have to the game server, uh, if you have a really poor connection or a really good connection, depending on the circumstances, sometimes the plate may think that you are instantly gone when you leave the plate. And sometimes it may think you were on there for a very, very long time, despite the fact that you're not on the plate anymore. So that in certain teams with inconsistent connection properties between the different players, uh, washing can be a pain in the ass, right? So for example, um, I know uh, the Silomar team, so the Tsunami team, back when they were running before pre-doing plates was found, uh, they would never get what we call like a one slide, right? Or like a zero slide. They mm -hmm. would always get two slides. Um, and that was because one or more of the players on their team had a connection that prevented them from kind of lagging the plates enough to get slides quickly um and what i mean by slides to be clear is like you would you kind of slide clockwise around the middle plate and um you could complete the whole puzzle in four players just sliding once that's a one slide with the nerf to luna faction boots shooting a full auto grenade launcher or rocket launcher at riven was no longer an option you would have to manually reload these with the release of beyond light however a new exotic sword called the lament would come down from the heavens to solve the Riven boss fight once again. This sword was incredible for Riven, putting out an absurd amount of consistent burst damage while completely avoiding any chance that a projectile would hit one of her eyes like in the old strategies. Hitting an eye could result in an instant reset. Teams continued to optimize their runs, progressively getting cleaner and cleaner executions. Times continued improving, with players from Silomar and Breeze setting two more records and getting the new fastest time down to 1546. Near the end of 2021, Bungie released the 30th anniversary DLC, and with it came new gear and new strategies. With this release came two new swords that would break open the limit on what was possible in speedrunning. These swords came with a brand new perk called Eager Edge, which was a perk inspired by the energy sword from Halo. This perk granted swords a massive bonus to lunge distance for a short time after swapping to it, something that could be utilized to rapidly catapult a player forward. However, Eager Edge has a lot more potential below the surface. New tech that was found that could launch players hundreds of meters horizontally using a well-timed input combination with jumping and sword swiping in tandem with the Warlock's Well or a Hunter's Shatter Dive ability, allowing players to reach breakneck speeds that had never been seen before. Furthermore, Eager Edge was also much faster and easier to use than the old world line strategy to manually launch relic holders in the Queen's Walk encounter, adding some much needed consistency to the last encounter of the raid. Around this time, players also started gaining a better understanding of the game's core mechanics and discovered that load zones and spawn mechanics could be manipulated to speed up transitions between encounters, as well as place raid banners backwards. Let me explain. Let's say if all six players left a load zone that a finished encounter had occurred in, and then five of them turned around and went back to the previous load zone while one player was doing the transition, the one player could pull the rest of the team by starting the next encounter. Furthermore, players realized that the default spawn point of the previous encounter's load zone was right next to the rally flag location, which they could reuse since the load zone was initialized again in a new instance. By returning to the new load zone and then blowing themselves up before they could touch the ground long enough to set a spawn point, these players could grab ammo from the old rally flag location and then be teleported to the next encounter by the one player doing the transition. The damage strategy for Riven was also optimized. Since every player on the team no longer had to do transitions, teams could bring slower classes other than Warlock. Teams started bringing one Titan who could provide a maximum damage buff with weapons of light for the team, as well as stack melee buffs to instantly take out a chunk of Riven's health with one two punch, Worm God's caress, offensive bulwark, and a melee. It was also discovered that you could shoot a waveframe grenade launcher behind the boss and the grenade would bounce around a bunch of times to do a ton of damage due to the boss's giant hitbox. Combining these with the previously forementioned Lament Sword resulted in an almost instant boss bake. Teams continued whittling down on the world record with these new strategies, and new runners were entering the competition. Runners were more motivated than ever, and new records were being set on the regular. The record went down 10 seconds, and then another 20 seconds and then another 30, 
and this just kept going before settling around 14 and a half minutes during the end of 2022. Would a sub-14 be possible? With the introduction of well skating when Yu Reg was released, a new out of bounds route was created for the entrance that allowed the player to go under the map to grab the rally flag through the floor to get their well, and then use it to well skate on an extremely complex route out of bounds that would allow the player to get all the way to the second encounter while the rest of the team was doing the first encounter. As soon as the first encounter ended, this player could start the second encounter to teleport the team to them, saving any time that would have been spent in the transition between the encounters. Shortly after Lightfall came out, runners developed a new strategy that was derived from the previous strategy using load zones in many of the transitions between encounters. Players discovered they could skip encounters by blocking the default spawn location with a bunch of crystals and then blowing themselves up. This would spawn players at the beginning of the next encounter, which could completely skip the entire transition. What are your thoughts on default spawn manipulation? Um, a lot of people in this game are, they associate speedrunning with movement, um, which I totally understand. Movement tech is a very big part of speedrunning. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, me personally, I really just care about making the run as fast as possible. And DSM, which is what you're referring to, default spawn manipulation, um, it just makes the run faster. A lot of people have this conception that DSM skips entire transitions and you're basically just going, you're teleporting from one encounter to the next. Which, you know, in some respects, sometimes it is like that. But in Last Wish in particular, um, there's still a lot of movement tech that is used to get to where the DSM starts. Uh, you can't skip the entire transition for the most major DSM. Uh, and for the other... There, there's two places where DSM is used in Wish right now. It's used between Shiro and Morgoth and Morgoth and Vault. Um, and the other one, Morgoth and Vault, you're actually gated to the Morgoth encounter. So you're kind of just waiting there anyway. Um, and I think DSM adds kind of like a unique, another kind of tool in the speedrunner's toolkit when it comes to speedrunning. Now, a lot of people don't hold that opinion because, like I said, a lot of people conflate movement tech with speedrunning. Uh, I think DSM is just a cool um, tool, another tool that we have in our toolbox to make the run faster. And um, it just happens to use stasis crystals. I mean, we, we do, we use teleportation tech in D2 speedrunning all the time, uh, whether it's, you know, getting pulled to a new encounter, whether it's death warping. Um, there's res manipulation, res breaches. So we do that. We're safe with that. We're comfortable with that. This is just a new idea, and I think the community is getting more accustomed to it. This was a massive time saved and improved the new run down to 1354. At this point, runs were so optimized that the new records were only being sent when new strategies were discovered. How much could the time possibly come down? Another four months passed, and yet another strategy was discovered. Runners discovered a new way to pre-charge the plates in the Shirochi puzzles, instantly auto-solving the puzzles, and finally getting rid of the painfully inconsistent washing machine strategy. With the arrival of Lightfall, Bungie also nerfed collision damage, and new movement tech was improvised that involved wall skating into curved surfaces to bounce off of them. This was used in various places, but most notably replaced the failing skip in Riven's final sand jumping puzzle. With the added layers of consistency, getting rid of the washing machine strategy as well as no longer relying on a phalanx to boost you, the record would be brought down to 1310. Would runners be able to achieve a sub-13? During the production of this video, Team Dishwasher destroyed the record again with a 1249. They pulled off what is currently the new standing record with a particularly creative skip for the Morgoth transition. During the Morgoth encounter, players could use a combination of grapples and ice climbing in order to climb over the top of the encounter, and then use an Eager Edge sword in combination with Needle Storm to needle skate and break through the boundary pushback box and walk out of the encounter and pull the rest of the team to the next encounter as soon as Morgoth falls. With all of that, where is the current player sentiment? Within the Wish community, are people actively still trying to set new records? Right now, the current record is a 12.49. A current good time would be a low 12. So we're talking a 12.0x or a 12.1x. That would be a pretty solid time for the strats that are currently available. Now, Wish isn't closed off from innovation. Um, right now, I've been practicing today and yesterday, and also this has been theorized for a while. You could have a hunter do the entrance to Shirochi skip. It is technically faster by like six to seven seconds, which is a big amount of time on a skip. And th right. that's six seconds against a perfect Warlock skip. Right, which has never been executed in a full run. You know, theoretically, that would save time. It would also mean that you'd have to do triple Hunter Morgoth skip, which is really, really AIDS. 
Uh, that's, that's really, really awful to run with. So at the end of Shiro Chi, you can skip over one of the walls to enter into the Shiro to Morgoth transition early. Um, so that is also time saved, but that is also extremely annoying to pull off. So those are strategies that are probably going to be saved for a rainy day after a better wish time has been set and people really want to, you know, continue to try to pursue and push the time down further. Uh, in terms of motivation, I don't think there's that many wish runners left, to be honest. I think Taco's team contains most of the people that are still interested in running the raid. You know, I'm probably going to revisit the raid at some point uh, with a team, but uh, that's not going to be probably for a while. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, it has potential. It's not like the raid is time locked or anything like that. Uh, people could definitely push it to an 11 uh, with the known strats. As of today, the current record is 12.33. If you want to listen to the full interview that I had with Aegis, I've got it up on my second channel. Links for that in the description. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, make sure to leave a like so that I know you enjoyed and I can make more of these. Thank you so much for watching until the end. You've made the four months of work that this video took all worth it to me. Thanks for watching. Bye!